Hey, 42 here. Have you ever gone to the supermarket hoping to just pop in for some eggs and milk, only to emerge two hours later like a contestant on Supermarket Sweep, with a bulging trolley full of frozen fish, microwave pizza, a decade supply of squirty cheese, and a discounted four-slice toaster you didn't even know you wanted? Well, it turns out you're not the only one. Most of us vastly underestimate how much we spend in the supermarket, because we tend not to realise how often we go or just how much we spend when we're there. The average UK shopper makes an incredible 221 trips to the supermarket every year, and apparently our friends across the pond enjoy a trip around the supermarket just as much as we do, because the average American spends over 60 hours per year buying groceries. Last year, supermarket sales topped $638 billion in the US, with Seattle residents coming in as the biggest spenders, splashing out over $500 every month on groceries. So just how do supermarkets convince us to part with so much of our hard-earned cash? You might be thinking it simply has something to do with the fact that they mostly sell food and drink the kind of things us non-Brefarians need to survive. And that's true, but it isn't the whole story. Because over the years, the marketing tactics of supermarkets have been carefully honed to the point that modern stores have evolved into near-perfect money-making machines, like the retail equivalent of the Xenomorph. Your local supermarket has been meticulously designed to manipulate you in ways you couldn't even imagine. Every single feature of the shop has been put there to do one of three things. Get you into the store, keep you there for as long as possible, and most importantly of all, ensure you make purchasing decisions based on emotion rather than logic. Let's start at the beginning. What's the first thing you do before you go into the supermarket? Unless you're just popping in for a cheeky six pack or a Tesco meal deal, you're probably going to try and find a basket or a trolley. And here's the first trick. Have you ever walked into the supermarket to find just one basket left with somebody else's empty Snickers wrapper in it? Well, that's because supermarket staff are deliberately told to limit the number of baskets available in order to try and get customers to take a trolley instead. Why? Because the bigger the cart, the more likely you are to try and fill it. According to business expert Martin Lindstrom, doubling the size of the shopping trolley leads shoppers to buy 40% more food. Which is probably why, since they were first introduced in 1937, shopping trolleys have tripled in size, and our waistlines have undergone a similar rapid expansion. Apparently, we really are that easy to manipulate. So you grab your trolley because you can't find a basket and head through the entrance of your local supermarket, at which point you enter something called the decompression zone. That might sound like the kind of place over-enthusiastic scuba divers go to ride out the bends, but it's actually just a large well-lit area at the front of the supermarket that you enter before getting into the main store. The decompression zone is there to help you transition from regular you the person who has a job and responsibilities and bills to pay, into capitalist you, the ruthless consumer who lobs a family-sized pack of mint chocolate chip ice cream into the trolley just because they can. You bloody maverick, you. Essentially, the decompression zone is there to give you a chance to get used to the store before you're properly inside, to become accustomed to things like the different lighting and floor textures, and to give you a chance to slow down from the frantic pace of life in the real world. For the most part, high value products are kept away from decompression zones, as most shoppers won't notice them. But supermarkets like to chuck a bit of subliminal messaging into the mix here by offering a kind of fresh off the farm experience using natural imagery, fresh scents and bright colours to inspire a happy and positive mental state in their customers. After all, would the shopping experience start on such a good note if the first things you saw were spam, dog food, toilet cleaner and light bulbs? Once inside, you'll most likely come across the fresh produce section of the supermarket. 
It's usually kept near the entrance to make sure you associate the store with fresh, wholesome food. And a common tactic in Europe and North America is to make sure the fruit and veg is regularly misted with water. You might assume this practice is there to help keep the produce fresher for longer, but in reality, there are other, more nefarious reasons behind it. Misting fruit and vegetables helps them retain more water, which sounds like a good thing. I'm sure we can all agree that nice plump melons look much more appealing than shriveled dry ones, until you realise most supermarkets charge you for this kind of stuff by weight. Regular misting can make some common veggies up to 25% heavier than their non-misted counterparts, meaning you're effectively buying a very expensive bottle of water alongside your Savoy cabbage without even realising it. Not only that, but dowsing fresh produce in water actually makes it spoil faster because it creates the perfect breeding ground for mould. So yeah, stay away from those wet-ass peppers. Supermarkets also seek to exploit your psychology in the way they're laid out. Most shoppers tend to stick to the outside perimeter of the shop, which is sometimes called the racetrack, which seems a bit of a stretch given that instead of Formula 1 cars packing V8s, the racetrack is mostly populated by grannies pushing squeaky trolleys, but there you go. The race track tends to be wider than the actual aisles, meaning it can accommodate more people and of course allow for overtaking grannies. Because the race track is so busy, promotions and special offers are normally placed at the ends of aisles, as these are areas of higher visibility. In fact, we are so conditioned to expect bargains in these locations that customers are 30% more likely to buy items at the end of aisles than in the middle. The same goes for the reduce section, which stores use to sell off as much food as possible before it expires. On the subject of expiry dates, most are actually quite misleading and are used to some degree by some supermarkets to get you to throw out products and replace them more often so that, yeah, you guessed it, you spend more money. About 1.3 billion tonnes of food is wasted around the world each year. That's about one third of the total amount of food bought for human consumption globally, and plenty more than enough to feed the 700 million starving people here on Earth. Something to think about the next time you chuck out some milk based on a pessimistic expiry date instead of the good old fashioned sniff test. Supermarkets may exploit the high foot traffic of the racetrack, but that doesn't mean they're content to just let you wander around the outside of the store and then leave. No, they want you to walk down as many aisles as possible. And to put as many oh-so-tempting products within your reach as they can whilst you're at it. Which is why they deliberately place very popular items, things like tea and coffee, or in the case of Covid, pasta and toilet roll, in the middle of aisles. But even once they've got you right where they want you, walled in on all sides by hundreds, even thousands of products, they're still employing sneaky techniques to bleed you for everything you've got. The most expensive products are normally put at shelves on eye level to make them more obvious, whilst cheaper alternatives are put on the top shelf out of reach. And items like kids' cereals are normally placed on lower shelves so they'll grab the attention of the little ones before mum has a chance to fob them off with muesli. On the topic of kids' cereals, have you ever noticed how so many have cartoon characters on the box? Like the Cocoa Pops Monkey, Frosty's Tiger, the Lucky Charms Elf, the Sugar Puffs Honey Monster, and the Cheerios Bee? That's because research has shown that if you make eye contact with a character on a cereal box, you're more likely to feel connected to the brand and will prefer it over other choices. In other words, kids don't just find these cartoon characters friendly, they're genuinely making friends with them, which might sound cute, but is a little bit creepy when you think about it. But can there be such a thing as too much choice? According to a study carried out by American psychologist Sheena Lienga, author of the best-selling book The Art of Choosing, there can. The average supermarket contains 44,000 different items, and enough variety to give even the most decisive shopper a bit of a headache. Lienga wanted to see how all this choice impacted shopper behaviour, so she manipulated the number of varieties of jam available to shoppers and tracked how it affected what they purchased. 
She found that when six varieties were available, only 40% of shoppers stopped to browse, compared to 60% when 24 varieties were available. So the more choice there is, the more likely people are to look. But that doesn't mean they actually buy more. Lienga found that choice is attractive, but too much choice can actually negatively impact sales. In the first scenario, with six varieties available, 45% of those stopping to browse ended up buying jam, whereas only 2% of people did when the full 24 varieties were available. The reason for this discrepancy lies in the way our brains are wired. The prefrontal cortex, which is concerned with working memory and decision-making, amongst many other things, is only capable of handling around seven pieces of information at any one time. Any more, and it quickly gets overwhelmed and sort of just panics and gives up, basically making the shopper abandon the task at hand and move on to something less confusing. So, if you're ever feeling overwhelmed, just remember, at any one time, thousands of people around the world are getting confused by jam. Now, there are ways you can support your prefrontal cortex, for example, by working things out with pen and paper, but you're unlikely to start jotting down the pros and cons of Smucker's strawberry jam versus Welch's raspberry jam in your journal. So in the context of a supermarket, that isn't too much help. A second option is to bypass the prefrontal cortex altogether and instead rely on gut instinct. From an evolutionary perspective, our gut instinct decision-making process is designed to cope with relatively straightforward decisions like whether or not to flee from a charging woolly mammoth. In the slightly more complex world of the supermarket, where woolly mammoths are rare, our gut instincts are not so reliable. There's simply too much sensory information to process. Bear in mind, the average Walmart superstore is 16,500 square meters, bigger than two Premier League football pitches stuck together. Our brains simply aren't designed to cope with so much stimulus over such a large area. One of the ways our brains tries to cope is by streamlining focus and choosing some bits of information over others. Generally speaking, a person can only read and understand four to seven words per second. And so we're less likely to make decisions in supermarkets by reading lengthy ingredient labels or the detailed history of a particular kind of cheese. Not that it's necessarily easier to make decisions by comparing price either. Supermarkets deliberately complicate things by showing mixed units. Sometimes milk is listed by price per pint and sometimes price per litre. Either way, supermarkets are milking us for all we're worth. So, if you can't use words and numbers to make good choices, we have to rely on something much simpler. What products actually look like? Studies have shown that 93% of buyers make decisions based on the visual appearance of products, and therefore manufacturers think incredibly carefully about the shapes and colours of their designs and packaging. Think about the rise of the quirky craft beer bottle designs like Brewdog or Bells which both use bright colours and quirky illustrations to be more eye-catching and memorable, as well as advertise their all-important hipster credentials. Colour is hugely important in helping brands shout at us from the shelves. In the UK, purple is so synonymous with Cadbury's chocolate bars, the company has actually trademarked their own specific shade. Whilst Coca-Cola's red is recognisable in virtually every country in the world. In fact, researchers have found that people feel so passionately about colours, they actually feel stronger emotions when looking at chocolate packaging than they do from tasting the chocolate itself. The same goes for shape. Think about the Toblerone Triangle, Kit Kat's Two-Fingered Salute, or Maltesers' Mighty Spheres. These are iconic shapes that are just as important to their brands as the taste of their products. Okay, so thanks to the insidious brain hacking of your local supermarket, you've run around the racetrack and completed a circuit of every aisle. Filling your trolley to the brim with things you didn't really want in the process, your shop is nearly complete, but you're probably still looking for milk and eggs because most supermarkets place them as far apart as possible in order to ensure you clock up a few more miles around the store before you leave.
Unless you really like to live life on the wild side, the checkout is the final hurdle of any supermarket shop, and it's also the most dangerous, because this is where supermarkets place all the things you know you shouldn't buy, but really, really want to. Sweets, chocolate bars, magazines, chewing gum, and other impulse buys that you're more likely to make when you're tired, hungry, and probably a bit emotionally vulnerable from all the subtle brainwashing that's been going on during your shop. The queue for the checkout is a golden window of opportunity for supermarkets for two reasons. Firstly, lining the checkout with sweets has a similar effect on children as lining it with crack would on a drug addict. All children come pre-programmed with a special skill known as pester power. And here is where they deploy it with extreme prejudice to nag their parents into submission. The second reason checkout traps are so successful is that people are more likely to make unhealthy decisions as they leave the supermarket. Because their brains want a reward for all the hard work they've been doing, getting thoroughly washed by the evil supermarket overlords. According to brain scan experiments at Bangor University in Wales, most people can make rational decisions for about 40 minutes of shopping. But after that, they stop being so selective and begin shopping emotionally. And this is when they accumulate all the stuff they never actually intended on buying. White chocolate cookies? Why not? A packet of Haribo? Sure. A buy one get one free bag of obscure Walker's Crisp flavours, which you're not even sure if you actually like. Who the hell even knows anymore? Not content with their current level of customer manipulation, supermarkets are always looking for ways to get better at parting us from our money. CCTV cameras may look like they're there for our safety and to stop sneaky shoplifters, but they're also there to track our behavior and movements, so stores can shift promotions and offers around to make sure they get maximum exposure. Similarly, loyalty cards might seem like a customer benefit, but they're actually designed to track your purchases, something which will become all too evident the next time you try shopping online and find yourself bombarded with targeted ads for products you've bought in the supermarket. The truth is, there's no escaping the psychological power of supermarkets. Across the world, we have been indoctrinated by Iceland, manipulated by Morrisons, coerced by Costco, tricked by Trader Joe's and accosted by Aldi. Try as we might, we will continue to love Lidl's mini pastries and crave Kroger's hallowed halls. But at least knowing a few of the supermarket's dirty tricks might stop us from bankrupting ourselves every time we need to buy a loaf of bread. Thanks for watching. You can get your hands on my book, Stick a Flag in It, over on Amazon or on Audible. Links to both in the description below. Thank you.